Hi guys, Will here with this week's interview chair. This week we have Mr. Jeffrey Pepper. Hi, everybody. Today's special guest is Mr. Jeffrey Pepper. How are you, Jeff? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Good. Look at, your, look at you. The sun's doing you well. You look great. <laughs> uh, well, we, you know, it, it's that time of year down here. That it's some of the best weather of the year in, in uh, from mid-March to mid-April, and, and then it starts getting hot and rainy again. Well, we had and freezing rain yesterday, so... <laughs> You can have it. I, I moved out of New York for a reason. I don't want it. <laughs> I do not miss plowing snow, let me tell you. I'm sure. Not even that much. <laughs> yeah, we had a crazy winter. Oh, wow. Well. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. No question. Well, well let's get started. I, the first okay. question is, is I want to know how you got involved in our sport of dogs and how old you were when you got involved. Um, I was in my late 20s. I purchased, I uh, was living on my own, working, and, and, and uh, for those days, making a pretty damn good living. I was making over 20 grand a year in the 60s, in the late 60s, and um, things were a whole lot cheaper then. Gas was like, uh, I don't know, 49 cents a gallon or something yeah. like that, uh, maybe less than that. I bought my first house in 69 right after I got married. Uh, for uh, $34,900, if my memory is right. Or maybe it was 36. And, you know, it was a nice size four bedroom house on, on a third of an acre in a, in a development in, in, in uh, Rockland County, New York. So nowadays that thing would be worth probably a million bucks or close oh, to it. Oh, sure. Yeah. So, so <laughs> things change. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I bought a golden retriever. I was living in an apartment and um got married to barbara and um who got me she had a golden that's what got me in, in into the goldens i grew up with dogs i had my first dog when i was probably five years old it was a uh american cocker that looked more like an english cocker because we're talking about the late 40s yeah and uh, they didn't look anything like they look like now and um Unfortunately, it died of distemper uh, maybe two, three months after we got it. There was no vaccination for distemper in those days. Not back then. And it, it, was, it, it was around. It was a real problem. Um, and a couple of years later, my father, for reasons I have never understood for the, in, in my entire life, made a business trip to Paris and came home with a poodle. What possessed him, I don't know. He was not doggy, um, never was. He certainly didn't know from pets as, as a youngster. Uh, they didn't have money for those things in those days. But he came home with this poodle, and it was... Uh, I, mean, I, I struggle to, to describe it. It was like a smaller standard. It certainly wasn't a mini. It was definitely a standard in my memory anyway. Um, but it wasn't as big as the standards today. Let me put it that way. And that dog lived a good long life. And I grew up with that dog sleeping in my bed. Um, and so dogs have always been a part of my life. At this point, I have the golden. We got married. And uh, I'm living. We weren't yet married. I, I, I living in an apartment. And I realized I've got to train this dog because I, I can't carry him outside as he gets any bigger. And, and I'm on the second floor, so he's got to go down the hall and down the stairs to go outside. And um, then we got married, moved up in, into Rockland, and I got involved in an obedience school to teach the dog what to do. And What year would this be? Uh, 68 or 69, somewhere. Probably 69. Okay. And um, 
the instructor said, you know, he's really good at it. You should go to a match show because he could probably get uh, his CD degree. And I said, what's that? And he explained what it is. So I went to a match show because it was good practice. And about the third, fourth one I went to was in New Jersey. Match shows in those days were big deal. Yeah. Five, six, seven, eight hundred dogs was not an unusual match show. And the judges were all people who knew what the hell they were talking about in those days and were interested in judging at some point, or they wanted to judge their own breeds. Um, anyway, I went to this match show in New Jersey and I entered him in, in, in obedience. And as I was filling out the paperwork, a lady with a golden came next to me to fill out her own uh, entry. And she said, oh, he's, uh, you have a nice golden there. Is he entered in confirmation? I said, what's that? And she sort of explained it. And uh, she said, why don't you enter him? And I said, I have no idea what to do. Uh, and she said, well, you know, why don't you enter him? All you have to do is follow and just see what everybody else does and, and copy them. And it was two bucks to enter. So I said, what the hell for two bucks? So I entered the dog. Long story short, he wound up high in trial on the day, high in match, and um, he won the breed and the sporting group and went best in match. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the trophy was this stainless steel butter dish <laughs> that with a wooden top. I still remember, I had it for years and it got lost in a move somewhere. I don't know where it is. <laughs> but he went high in trial and best in show in essence. And I had a rosette, you know, it wasn't just a stinky little ribbon with a real rosette. And I thought, well, this is kind of fun. So we started doing match shows. And then we decided, well, let's put him in a real show. So being total novices, uh, we picked, we, we looked on AKC and, and here was his only golden show in New Jersey. Well, let's go. Well, it turned out to be the 1972 National Specialty. And he was entered in the novice class and damned if he didn't place. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there were like 14, 16 dogs in the class. And he placed, I think, second or third, whatever it was. And that sort of cemented it in. And it, it went from there. He wound up not only finishing, but he won several groups. Uh, it turned out to be quite a nice dog. And then we thought, well, let's try and wanted a better dog. And there was this young dog that was being shown by his owner, a um, guy by the name of Larry Johnson from New Jersey. And the dog's name was Charlie, uh, later champion Cummings Gold Rush Charlie. <laughs> And we thought he was quite pretty. Yeah. And, we at the, and I still remember this because it was the Rockland County Kennel Club show. And I eventually was vice president of that club. And and uh, the breeder was there, a guy by the name of Lynn Cummings. So I'm talking to him and I'm asking him about a, a male like that. And he looked at, at, at Bricky, at my dog, and he said, you don't need a male. You've got a lovely male there. You want a bitch. You want a female because you might want to breed. Okay. Uh, he said, well, I did a repeat breeding of, of Charlie's uh, litter, and I have a lovely bitch in that litter. Would you like to come and look at her? Okay. So we drive down to New Jersey and go look and wind up buying this bitch puppy. Um, I think she had, she was an outstanding damn. She had four or five champions, six champions, seven champions to her credit. I, I'd have to go look it up. I don't remember anymore. But she was she was good. And she, of course, finished. Um, and that, it, 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 it grew from there. Uh, bought another bitch. Um, that was Poppy. And um, gave her eventually to a new handler who had apprenticed with the Forsyth and then with Bill Trainer, um, who was giving Barbara some hints, showing uh, her as a special, and she was actually winning breeds. And in those days, golden bitches were best up and dogs were best to breed. And that was kind of written in cement. It was very unusual for a bitch to win the breed. 
uh, in, in Golden's in, in those days. And Poppy actually wound up changing that dynamic. She uh, entered the Golden Hall of Fame after, was the first bitch, and I believe it was 25 years that had made it in, there had been lots of dogs in that time, but she was the first bitch in 25 years that had made it into the Hall of Fame. Um, anyway, we gave, we gave young... it Elliot. <laughs> it was Elliot Moore. <laughs> I knew that. <laughs> a, a newly minted handler. Um, I think just married or just about to marry Linda. So we're going back at 70, 77, 78 maybe, 78. And um, there was another handler who really wanted her, wanted the bitch. Um, you can guess who it was. I don't know whether I want to get into that story here. I, I don't know. I think we should. It's better not to. Uh, and I eventually, that, that individual made my life quite difficult for a while. And I finally said to him, look, when I'm dead and buried, you're not getting this bitch. So just forget about it. And uh, Elliot took her, went best up, put several groups on her in the first month. And went best stop at the National under Bob Wills down in uh, uh, Virginia, uh, Fredericksburg, I think it was, in, in, in Virginia. Um, to, uh, she went best op to, Char uh, to Charlie, actually. Okay. Um, or was it Teddy? No, it wasn't. It was Gold Rush's great teddy bear. Okay. Okay, who was a, a, a half sibling. I think I remember seeing Charlie at the, he came up to the show of shows with Bill in I think yeah. 1975 around there. So yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I think it was it was it was Teddy, newly finished. But I wouldn't swear to that at this point. <laughs> um well the reason is we proved we proved the teddy bear dog. We, we did his first, uh, we whelped his very first litter. He was not yet a champion out of the bitch I bought from Lynn, who was a Charlie full sibling. So it was a really tight light breeding without our realizing quite how tight it was. And there were like four or five champions in that litter alone. Several kennels actually were based on bitches from that litter. It was it was an extremely good litter, um, and I'm I'm confused as but I'm pretty sure it was Charlie and 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 Poppy was best stop and then in '79 she won the breed under Annie Clark um, to a dog from from California, uh, Caper I think was his call name and uh, Randy showed him. Randy. So, uh, Sh Sh uh, Schlepper out uh, from, from Washington. Okay. That, that was way back when. Um, trying to remember, gal who owned the dog lived back east, I think, or she may have lived out there at that time and here and then moved back. I've, I've lost track of it, but that that that's that's where it all started. And 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 that was we a good start. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it, it, it was a very nice start, but it actually started with Ricky, who I bought for 150 bucks uh, as a pet from a very well-bred litter. Um, I didn't know where to go for my golden, and Barbara was related to Dr. Irene Kraft, who was Narissita, uh, who had been involved with Goldens for many, many years. Uh, she uh, lived in, in also in, nearby where we were. And, and so I went to Irene and asked where to, to, I could get a, a decent puppy. She sent me to this litter. It was a very well-bred litter, but this was a pet dog and $150 was a lot more money in yeah. 1968 than, than it is now, but still wasn't a whole lot of money. And, and it, it all grew from there with the Goldens anyway. Yeah. And then PBG started in 84. 84, okay, well, let's hear that story. So you went from, um... How did you decide on PBGBs? What made you? Well, um, it's kind of interesting. <laughs> that story I could tell you. It's a funny story. Uh, I was still friendly with Bill. 
at, at this time. Bill actually turned Poppy down. I asked him first, and he wasn't interested. And that's when Elliot started feeding Barbara these hints of how to, you know, uh, how to make her look better sure. and do even better than she was. I remember one day she won the breed, um, and Bobby Barlow was handling one of the dogs, and he said to her, I'm glad you won the breed. There's no way that any of these dogs can beat the quality of that bitch. And I had the greatest respect for Bobby before that. But after that and going forward, I really had tremendous respect for him. He got beaten and he went out of his way to say how nice the bitch was. And there was no way his dog should have beaten the bitch. And, you know, handlers today, I, you know, They'd have a hard time doing that, I think. Many of them would, anyway. Yeah. Um, Bobby was a great guy. He was. He really was. And and he definitely missed. I remember how upset he was when, when yeah, when the bug died. Anyway, uh, the, the, the PBGVs, um, Bill was showing a dog called uh, Champion West Falls Bearing Gifts. A wire haired dachshund read by Peggy, Peggy Westfall. And I really liked this dog. I thought he was cuter than hell. He had a, a really nice temperament. And so I thought, you know, I'd like another breed, maybe get a, a, a dachshund to get a wire. And um, I went to um, Peggy. She didn't have one. She said, check with D. We went to D. Hutchison. D didn't have one, and she said, there's nobody around who has any decent wire at this point. You don't even have to bother looking. And she was right. There, there, there wasn't. But I always liked the look of that dog, and I always liked that dog. And then maybe three years later, that was the year that either Lily won or the, or, or the uh, Irish Water Spaniel. I forget which it was that year. But... Uh, and and Snelling figures into this story. Yeah. Ann took an ad in Dog News with a picture of one of her PVGVs. They, they were not yet even recognized in Canada. That was a new breed. She'd brought over Clouseau. Do you remember Clouseau? I remember Clouseau, yeah. Okay. She'd brought over Clouseau and, um, from the UK and brought over somebody else. I don't remember whether Garrett was showing Clouseau. And he put several bests on the dog. And um, I thought, well, this, this is really cute. I like all the fuzzy face. I, I've had this since the 60, mid-60s. So, you know, I always thought that was kind of cool. And, and so I got in touch with Ann. And um, she said, well, I don't have anything now. And anything that I have in litters, I'm not letting out of Canada until we get the breed recognized. And 84 at the Centennial Show in Philadelphia, we picked up a bitch, a Clouseau daughter from Anne at, at the show. And um, uh, Pistache was her name. And uh, got involved with the breed at, at, at that point. Uh, later brought over two more a dog and a bitch from the UK. Um, quite honestly, none of them were really very good. They were uh, they were lacking in type. They looked more like grounds than petits. Uh, they, they were kind of a combination of petits with ground heads and ground tails. If you were too long, they, was, they weren't right. Um, but they won because they were sound and... <laughs> It was nothing else. Nobody knew what the hell Brand they were new. looking exactly. at. Then they had that super match. Okay. And uh, were you there? Do you remember the, that? The Canadian super match? No, the oh, one okay. down here, it was in protest against um, uh, Sandy Schwartz's show, uh, uh, Tacon uh, not Taconic Hills, um, Tuxedo Park. Uh, the Westchester weekend, and it was, I forgot exactly what it was, but they did it against that sh against that show. Teddy Young was doing um, best puppy in show, and the petit there was a petit puppy there 
that the Barths had bought from, um, oh God, I can't remember. I, I just had it too. I've just lost her name. Uh, bought it up in Canada. Uh, a Bassett gal who had um, the teas way back when. Bassett guy. Uh, no, a lady. And I, I'm not even sure she had Bassett's, but she had another breed and she got, I'll think of the name when I stop trying to remember the name. <laughs> yeah. And, and anyway, he, he had, that puppy was so cute. It was like six months in the day, you know, and with those cute fuzzy face and everything like that. It, it was it was not the world's best PBG, but it was the best one there because it was the only one there. And Teddy put it up because the whole everybody was just cheering for this puppy dog, and um, it went forward from there. We realized then that when we started to think about breeding, that we really didn't know what the hell we were dealing with there because all we had were names on pedigrees. Mm -hmm. At this point. You know, um, we're already second or third generation in, in Goldens because we bred. We didn't just have one litter every two years. We had a couple of litters a year, um, had no problem selling Golden puppies. So that wasn't an issue. And, and you know, we had some goals in mind that, that, that we wanted to reach. And, and we were line breeding, but we were doing it from a basis of, of knowledge of pedigrees and so forth. Um, I could still probably do a four or five generation pedigree of my early dogs in my head today because you had to type them or write them in those days. You know, it wasn't a computer spitting them out that you'd done it on there once. And, and so you learned at one point, I think we traced back uh, 13 generations of what was behind um, where, where we were. And there was some fantastic stuff that went back into the early 1900s and that's as far back as we got with it um anyway we had no idea what what the, the pbgvs that were in the pedigree looked like so we decided that we had to go to england to see where these dogs what they looked like and what they really were because how do you decide what, what you want to breed ran into nick trust at, at that point who was the the um uh, major breeder in, in, in the UK and uh, got quite friendly with him. He was here judging and, and invited us to come over and we did. And we spent two weeks there, uh, went to Hound Show, went, went to a number of, of, of all breed shows because in the middle of the summer, went to the one in the New Forest, I can't think of the name, went, it went to several and, and um, saw the dogs and talked to, to people who had been in the breed for 10, 15 years at that point, which was a long time for the UK, and discovered that the dog that everybody in the States was line breeding on was in fact the petite champion in one country and a grand champion in another country. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh-huh. Well, they would breed <laughs> were bred until 1975. Okay. So that was not illegal. It was quite plausible. It turned out because what they did, since they came from the same litter, is at a year of age, somebody from, from the French club would go and examine the dogs from the litter, petit, petit, grand, petit, grand. That's how they, they were assigned. And it wasn't until 75 that the, the uh, crossing of the two were, were, was outlawed. They did develop separate uh, breed standards for the two, but they were still kind of coming. So you had this real mix. Sometimes you had a petit upper jaw and a grand lower jaw, or the other way around and you get parrot mouth. Um, it's why you still find long, low petits that have grand type heads that have a head that's more characteristic of a, of a grand basset than a petit basset. I could get into this. There's a whole lot of, of uh, back history on the breed that uh, most people have never really studied. Most people have never even seen the four. There are actually four breeds of Griffon Bonnel. It's the only French hound that comes in four sizes. All the others are three. Only, only the petits have a, a petit basset, and a, I'm sorry, only the, the Griffon von Leon have a, a, a petit basset and a grand basset. All the others have a basset breed, a briquet, which is like Springer size, and then the full size, the grand. 
it appears from what studying I've, I've, I have done that the otter hound and the Grand Griffon, the big one, um, actually both go back to the old Vendier hound and might in fact be related. Um, you'd have to go back several hundred years to do that, and of course we can't, so there's no way of knowing. Um, I don't know if DNA could do it or, or, or couldn't do it, but it would appear that there was some, um, that they, they all came from the same basic rootstock going back eventually to the hounds brought in from, from Rome. You can see uh, that. You can see the similarities for sure. Yeah. Um, so, it, it's similar. I mean, if you've seen a party colored um, uh, otter hound, damned if they don't have a petite. And then you, there's got to be some, I would think, some hound influence in the Spinoni as well. Whether they want to recognize it or not, that head is, is it's a lot of similarities in there as well. Going back, and it would all go back to, to the Roman hounds back in, 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 in uh, what, a thousand years ago? Yeah. <laughs> or more, 1,500 wow. years ago. Um, who knows? Who it's knows? Interesting. It's interesting to speculate. We'll never know. But that's how we got involved. And those were the two breeds that, that I've been personally involved with, both breeding extensively and owning. I've had Cavaliers since the late 80s. Uh, I had my first Whippet back in 77, was a boy's son, sporting field clansman's son uh, from Donnie and, 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 and Jim Butt. So I knew Debbie when she was still in junior. When all, actually, all three of them were still in juniors at that point. It goes back that far. Um, <laughs> and I've got to, as you saw before, I've still got to whip it. Yeah, yeah. We see her wandering through. Yeah, she wanders around. In, 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 she's right over yeah, here in, 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 in the bed. Um, and she's a tawny daughter, actually. She's nine. So, And I had Springers, English Springers. Um, Couple of greyhounds, uh, one from Maida Putterman. Oh uh, yeah, her daughter. It was a mahogany daughter. Um, the mahogany and, was beautiful. Yeah, she was, and 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 the Miranda was the daughter. She was winter's bitch at the the day after the national that was an anniversary one, uh, and it was held out on Long Island. And I still remember the judges that Dr. Elsie was still around. And and uh, she was she was telling me my bitch's pedigree going back into, into five and six generations out of her head. The woman was unbelievable. Wow, <laughs> unbelievable. When did you start judging, Jeff? I started judging. Um, I had provisional approval, I believe, in '85. The books will say I'm 86 because they had to finish your provisions and we had to eight in those days. I started judging. I never intended to judge. Uh, one day, Frank Harrah, you remember Frank? Mm -hmm. AKC rep. Yep. Frank yep. came up to me at, at, at a show um, and he said, I want you to apply for golden retrievers. I said, what? He said, I want you to apply for goldens. We need some breeder judges. We're losing type in the breed, and I like this breed. I don't, I don't like what's going on, so I'd like you to apply for the breed. And I said, oh, okay, what do I have to do? And Frank told me, and in those days, you had to pass uh, a, a written uh, proctored test of the breed standard without an open book, um, and you had to go through interviews and, and, and provide uh, references, and, and you had to have read... Uh, you know, so so and so many litters and whatever, and um, I was approved for for Goldens. Um, I remember when I I had my interview. Frank was telling me all about the things to watch out for when you're judging running a ring and so on and so forth. And I said, Frank, aren't you going to ask me anything about the standard? Because I had studied like crazy for this. And he said, Don't insult my intelligence. He had asked me to apply for the breed. Now he's going to ask me yeah, to exactly. tell him about it. Yeah. yeah, and it made perfect sense. But uh, you know, um, so '86 officially was was February, I think, of '86 was when I was officially approved. 
Um, it took, I finished all my provisionals very quickly. They were all specialties, but two, uh, two all breed shows. And I could tell you stories about what I had to do in those first two shows, but I'd have to mention names again, and it's probably not uh, that's <laughs> either. <laughs> well, I, I can tell you that uh, my very first show, um, of course, I was nervous as hell, and I had two difficult situations. Well, just going into, into dogs, there was a handler in there who I really did not like as a person. And I had to make a decision, was I going to judge handlers or was I going to judge dogs? And I judged dogs and the handler won. Um, because, you know, you, you just have to make that decision yeah. right from the get go and, 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 and you're either gonna do it or, or you're gonna, you're, you're not. And I, 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 there was no way I was gonna do that. And then I had a, a American bred bitch class of two. One could uh, drink out of a Coke bottle without a straw. And, and the other one had no hair. And, and, and um, nothing, nothing going for it either, but at least it couldn't stick its nose down the Coke bottle. And the question was, okay, which one's one and which one's two? And, you know, that was far more difficult to do than almost any class I've ever done because I didn't want to do what I had to do and I had to decide. Eventually, the, the, one, the, the one without any hair was a little typier, and so it won. Uh, neither of them was particularly sound, but you, know, you still had to go one and, one and two. And then um, at, at a subsequent all-breed show, the same handler from the first show um, had a different animal in the ring and uh, in the specials class and um, thought that uh, that individual thought they owned me because they'd won the first time and they knew that I didn't particularly care for them. And um, I wasn't paying enough attention apparently to the bitch, so they took a piece of bait and chucked it right at me and hit me. And uh, I don't know whether they hit me with it was on purpose or not, but it did. And I bent down, picked it up, walked over to this individual, handed the individual the piece of liver and said, if you do that again, you're gonna have a bench show, bench show committee so fast, you'll never know what hit you. Who the hell do you think you are? And walked away. Yeah, and never had a problem with that person again. Uh, to their credit, sure, never had a problem again. But sometimes you 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 sort of have to do those things. It 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 is what it is, and and you know this is my ring. You're going to do it my way, and I'm not going to stand for that kind of behavior in my ring. Sorry, it's yeah. not going to work. So it has to be. I, I would do the same thing today. If if it came up, that that enough history for you? <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, so I could tell you. you have, what do you have now? What, what what are you licensed for now? Well, I am licensed for all sporting, all hounds, Cavalier, King Charles Spaniels, Best in Show, here in uh, uh, some other countries. I've judged all breeds. Yeah. Um, but I'm not technically approved for all breeds, but I have. So I've had entries of, I had an entry of, of 36 or 40 Frenchies once. And I make it my business to study the standard. And, and, and uh, you know, if I know what breeds I'm doing ahead of time, I read those standards and I try and watch them and try and get some idea of, of, of what it is. And apparently I must have done a decent job because nobody killed me afterwards and nobody filed a complaint. Actually, I got some compliments on, on, on the consistency of what I've done. And then I remember doing border collies at, at that same show. And um, this one individual owner handler won dogs and, 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 and bitches and obviously the breed and I wanted to do some photos. And I said, uh, are, are these dogs uh, imports? And they said, yeah. 
Um, and I said, from the U.S.? And they said, yeah. I said, sporting fields, right? And they said, how did you know? Debbie puts a type on, on everything she breeds. I mean, there's some people who just do that. A stamp. Look, it's a stamp on it. I mean, you look at, 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 at an elk hound, you know whether it's one of Pat Trotter's or not. She's put a stamp on it, they, on, on her particular style. Uh, and, and I think that's fine as long as you stay within the... I think that's actually the mark of a good breeder. Oh, yeah. When you can recognize family. Established yeah. a style within the parameters of the breed standard such that you can look at the dog in the ring and say, this is a XYZ Farms dog or bitch, or whatever. And you used to be able to do that. I can still, in, in my own breeds, in Golden, certainly, I can guess way back what, what these dogs go back to in, in, in many cases, because that stamp is still buried in there. And today, that's very, very rare. There are so few that really put a mark on a dog, on, on a dog uh, bloodhounds from Susan, um, uh, Susan Hamill out in, 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 in California, for example. You, you, you can pretty much see what's going to come. There's a consistency to it. Uh, Connie Miller's golden, certainly. There was no question that was a Malagold dog. For sure. That one, you know, that came out. Um, we don't have those big breeders. There are, others, though, there, really. there, there are a couple of ladies up in Ontario, I think, that bred English setters. And damned if they didn't, and I can't think of their names now, but they bred beautiful English setters, or still do, and, and they, you could pick out. Yeah. Their dogs stood out as, as coming from there, like Eileen stand out. Right. Uh, there, there's those few, but we need more of those. Yeah, we, we don't have the big breeders anymore that have those litters all the time that they can establish that family type, you know. Well, but they also aren't too many people, in, in, in my opinion now, we're looking for the easy way out, you know. Um, we have our litters on demand. My, my bitch is going to whelp on next Thursday. I already made the appointment. So we do a C-section so you don't have to deal with, with, with that. We do our breedings. Uh, all through AI instead of natural breedings. And I think we pay a price for doing these things. We have a lot of dogs and a lot of breeds with low libido nowadays. And I think that's coming because we're breeding dogs who couldn't breed on their own artificially. And so we're, we're allowing what wouldn't have come through in the past because the breedings were done naturally. Um, and a dog with a low libido, people aren't going to use it. Right, you wouldn't get the job done. Growing so. blanks, why do I, you know, yeah. I don't, she only comes to see them twice a year. I can't afford to, to have a dog that's shooting blanks, that, that, that's not producing puppies. So we're going to go to somebody who produces. Or we're looking, okay, uh, Gertrude's in season. Who's winning now so we know who to breed her to? Yeah. Yeah. And Going back to this yeah, stuff, you, know, you have to know your pedigrees. You could be doubling up on faults without even realizing it. Oh, for sure. For sure. If you go back to, to what you're talking about, the stud dogs with low libidos, it shows up in their performance in the ring, too. You, you dog, yeah. If my dogs just aren't stallions anymore, you know, yeah. so I see that all the time. You know, I saw a picture the other day and somebody made a comment that's a stallion of a dog. And damned if it wasn't. Right. And there's something that you can see that comes through that is above and beyond the the the, the norm of, of, of what we see. I miss the days. Do you remember? I, I don't know if, if you go back far enough. I can remember going to shows and watching Wire Fox Terriers and there'd be three best in show dogs in the breed ring. Or four. Oh, yeah. And they were worthy best in show dogs, every damn one of them. And they fought tooth and nail, those handlers. They Every hair was in plate. You remember that? Do you oh, go back sure. and look for that? Okay. Yeah, my first show and, was 75, so I was yeah. 74. So, I, yeah. so, you, so you did. I mean, I remember watching Bobby Fisher, Peter Green, and, and you know, we could go, go. 
start naming. Um, and these guys were commensurate terrier people, and these dogs were put down magnificently. And who's going to win the breed today? Yeah. And they did this consistently. Instead of running away from the competition, they ran to. Well, we didn't have as many shows back then, so they all had to go to those shows. Yeah. I remember yeah. the Florida circuit the year. Yeah. I think it was. Uh, oh, my here. God. I yeah. was working for Bobby, and it was Clay was there, and Pete was there, and the Wirefox chair read was 10 deep to sit and watch it. So Absolutely. Absolutely. And other rings also, but I, I picked up Wirefox because. That that to me, you know, that was like the epitome of these really showy ass dogs. Oh, they were stallions. Oh, beautifully boys. put together, yeah. magnificently put down, and 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 perfectly handled. And the sweat that was pouring <laughs> from the handlers working to get these dogs up on their toes and looking, you know, looking right. Um, and you don't see that maybe in the group room, but even there. Yeah, that's really not the same. Yeah. I, I I know what you're saying is that like you, you would almost mark your schedule. I, I want to go watch wires. Yeah, I want to watch wires. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there were certain breeds yeah. where you could do that, and there were other bit pointers at, at one point. Well, I the remember watching Irish. pointers was amazing. Yep. It, it, back in 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 those days, and there were other breeds as well. Goldens, not so much. But I remember going to a show. It was the Cherry Blossom Circuit, and I was taking pictures. I was about I don't know eleven or so, and I was there was in the Irish Setter Ring because that was my family breed. And there was George and Janie and Tommy and, and Bobby was there, and it was just you know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I did one of my first assignments in in Irish Setters was in Kentucky, in Lexington. On 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 the on the circuit, and they had an Irish setter, especially. I had a 130, 140, wow. whatever to have huge entry. And George had an absolutely stunning young bitch. Um Clover Leaves Rebecca. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly right. And man, she caught my eye. And I just, she came right through it. But the standard says brick on brick. And damn, they all, most of them, had a head that was brick on brick. None of this. Yeah. You know, and 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 they had fronts. They had, they had angulation in the fronts. Their shoulders weren't pointing at the ears. I mean, I could go on and on and on with well, it. Well, when there's that many entries, they make everybody better. Was Rebecca, I had I, I had lost it for a second, but absolutely. And she just and she was immaculately presented, but so were so many others yeah. Yeah. in that ring. It was it so to. much fun. You wanted to compete with those with those guys and those women, you had to you had to be as try to be as good as you they had were. to be as good. You know, one of the most fun experiences I ever had judging. I'm in in the Midwest. I think it was um, Kansas or somewhere in that neck of the woods. And I'm doing the Hound Group. I've done gun dogs on the day, and I'm doing the Hound Group. So I have not seen any of the hounds. Now, I personally don't like that. I would rather do the group, the sporting group, on the day I'm doing the sporting group. Right. I chose yep. the dogs. Let me... You know, yeah, you why, why reinvent the wheel? But that's a, se a separate story. And so I bring them in, and I bring them in one at a time, but close together, just enough space between that I can look at each dog quickly, individually, and get a sense of how well it's using himself and how balanced it is and so forth. And the Afghan comes in and starts going, oh, that's a gorgeous Afghan. That's probably going to win the group, you know, I'm thinking. Boom, 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 more of them come in, and a whippet comes in, and I'm going, whoa, look at that whip. And she's stunning. That's going to, oh, uh oh, I'm going to have a problem here. And it came down to, in the end, I have the whip it and the Afghan. And I'm having a dreadful time deciding which one is one and which one is two. So I take the two of them around together. They're both really good moving sound dogs. Down and back clean both ways. I got to make up my mind. You just can't stand there. They're not going to get any better. You've got to make up your mind. So what am I going to do here? Well, I've seen other Afghans that moved 
as well as this dog, and were as typey as this dog had gorgeous type, really pretty headpiece, just really pretty type. And I'd not had him before, nor had I had the Whippet before. These were two brand new dogs for me. And the Whippet is stunning. She's got a magnificent headpiece with a really dark eye that just sucks you in and a good, strong underjaw, which is so hard to find anymore. And she holds her curves going around the ring, which is very rare in Whippets nowadays. Most of them tend to flatten out as they're going around the ring. This bitch holds the curves. Which one is going to win? I love them both. I finally decided, okay, the Whippet is winning because I've seen other Afghans that move just about as well as that one that are near, pretty much as pretty as this one is, but I haven't seen another Whippet hold curves like that and be that pretty. So the Whippet's won and the Afghans too. Kind of a silly thing to, to make up your mind on, but I need something to hang my head. Oh, for on. sure, for sure. And as I'm giving out the rosettes, I asked the two of them to wait a minute while I give out three and four. And I, I said to the two of them, I want you to know how I made my decision and why. Because I love both of these and I want to see them both again. They're spectacular dogs. All right. And I told them what I just told you. The dog was the Mowgli dog. Oh. Four-time national specialty winner, three-time, whatever. Okay. And the bitch was Tawny, who was the number one hound the following year, I think, or the yeah. year after that. So two magnificent dogs, neither of which are around anymore. So I'm, I'm quite comfortable telling you that story. Uh, both of whose breeders I have tremendous admiration for for what they do and, 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 and their dedication to their, to their breeds and what they've produced over time, okay? Yeah. Um, and, and I have to say, Jay, was, Jay said to me, you know, I have to agree with you, which is quite something to say because they both wanted that group. Oh, sure, yeah. Without, I mean, that was just stunning in there. That, I had more fun doing that going through all of them. You, you notice I didn't say anything negative, negative about either one. I, I, I don't like fault judging. I'm looking for the positives. They both had them. Which one had the one that outweighed the other? I had to come down to something that's really relatively simple. It held the curves, sure. except it isn't. And, and, and so there it was. Uh, they're both outstanding dogs. That for me is fun. My story about the two the two golden bitches in my first assignment, neither of which was really worthy. I probably should have withheld and, and been done with it, and I, I could have justified it. It was my first assignment. I wasn't going to kick dogs out of the ring. Now I would do it. Um, I would, I'll take as many times as you offer it to me, I will take the second opportunity, that group opportunity, and have another opportunity to judge like that. The closest thing to it was when I did the Hound Group at the Garden. But that wasn't as difficult for me as those two were. Wow. Eh? <laughs> that's something. So that, that, that's how much respect I had for both of those animals. So as a judge, what advice, like I, I'm starting to judge now. I, I just got the first half of sporting up here. What advice would you give for a new, to a new judge? Don't be in a rush to move to new breeds. Realistically, you don't really learn a breed as a judge until you're actually in the ring having to make the decision by yourself, for yourself. It takes six, eight, 10, 12, maybe 20 times before you really are comfortable with a breed that's new to you. Now, I'm not talking about breeds that you showed a whole mess of them. Yeah. I'm talking about those breeds that you didn't, okay? Not necessarily your first bunch because your first bunch, you probably pick breeds that you're familiar with. And then you start branching out. But don't be in a rush to, to move on and look at look at positives before you look at negatives. Eventually, you're gonna you get stuck with negatives. Okay, yeah. but I'd rather say I like the mouth on this one better than the one on that one. 
then I don't like the mouth on that one. Right, right. Stick with it, virtues. It, it, right. it's, it's a different... If you look for virtues, you won't go wrong. If you look for faults, and well, I can't use that because it's got a bad bite, you might be throwing the best dog in the ring out. And the one that looks different than all the others is not necessarily a bad dog. It might be the best. Right. I've that seen that be, a lot. Well, we've, all, we've all seen that a lot. We've all seen that. If you, you know, sometimes you get one good one in and there's 10 mediocre dogs and the one good one stands out like a sore thumb, it doesn't look like the other. They're not supposed, they don't have to all look the same. They can look different. That's fine. You're supposed to pick the one that comes closest to the requirements of the breed standard. For me, I look, I cannot divorce movement and structure from type on any breed that has a job. Maybe on some of the toy breeds that, whose job is to be carried around or to just hang around, I might be willing to, to, to compromise on that. But I can't separate movement from type on any breed that has a job because they can't do their job efficiently if they're as efficiently as they can possibly could if they're structurally not sound. Right. That's part of type, I, I believe so. For me, it's part of type. So, you know, uh, everybody quotes Annie and Annie said it, first I saw it on type and then I picked the best movers of the bunch. I have trouble doing that. I need, if I'm judging goals, I need a good moving dog who has type according to the standard. And and I can't really divorce the two. Um, if, 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 if it's a gorgeous dog and its, hark, its hocks are making sparks as it's going away, and sometimes we see that in some of the breeds, um, I'm sorry, I, I have a problem with that. I, that. That to me is, that's a fault because it affects their ability to do the job that they were bred to do. And I think that a dog has to be able, I have to look at a dog and see it doing what it was bred to do, which carries you to the other's part of it. If it's at all possible, at least once, watch a retriever retrieve. And you'll understand why the standard asks for certain things in, 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 in a retriever. Watch a setter that actually sets, goes down. I had that happen to me once in, in a ring in, in uh, California of all places and then an outdoor ring with Gordon setters. And I've got like five or six over here and two birds land on the other side of the ring. And three or four of them went into a set. They crouched down. That's what they originally did because the net got thrown over them to catch the birds. So they would crouch down so the net wouldn't be too high. They, they instinctively did that. And the handlers were yanking to get him to stand up. The guy said, no, 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 let him be. That's their instinct. Let it be. And the birds realized what was going on and took off and, and the dogs got up and did. But it was so pretty for me to see that, that the, the instinct was still there. Go and watch them do what what they were bred to do. Watch a point or point and then flush and 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 retrieve, um, just once. And it you know those who did the the old Sporting Dog Institute, the first two that were done back in the nineties, that uh, DJA did with 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 uh, AKC. Okay. Uh, were you there? No. Did you ever hear about that? I yeah I don't know I don't know who was there though. Uh, it, it, it was a, a rather elite group that were, everybody wanted to go. And we were out in a field out in, in, in uh, San Jose or near San Jose um, on a knoll and there were a pond below us. And the teachers were Annie, Dottie Mack, Klaus Davern, um, Elliot Weiss, and Donnie Sturz. No, and 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 Ginny Long. Okay, I forgot Ginny. And so, top drawer experts on 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 gun dogs. Um, and we watched one dog of every breed plus a standard poodle do what they were bred to do. 
if they were bred to work in, 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 in duels or in a small group, then you'd bring two or three. Um, so you'd have the three setters out together, perhaps. There was no Irish, uh, red and white in those days. Um, yeah, just just to see them honor each other, which they which they're supposed to do. With some of the hunting yeah. dogs are supposed to honor the uh, the one who's who's got the initial retrieve, and the other one's supposed to stand there and not not go after. Watch watch this stuff. Watch what that standard poodle did. Watch what that American cocker did, and bring back a bird. And you understand why the size of the teeth and the the length and the, and size and depth of the muzzle becomes an issue. Well, you know why some of these things are in the standard. Why some of the standards ask for the coat to wrap the body, not to stand out from the body, and how we bastardize that for the show ring, and and make what the standard asks for incorrect for the show ring, which is just wrong in 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 in, in my opinion. Um, people know not to show me uh, an overly fluffed and fup, uh, a fluffed and puffed golden retriever because they know I'm not going to use it. Right. I'm going to show them what they did. I had somebody come in my ring while I was still judging with a Labrador, and they had literally taken and fluffed out and brushed the tail so it was round. That ain't an otter tail. <laughs> they're not brown and big and fluffy like and I, I i looked the handler in the eye and ran my hand right down the tail and they looked at me and i said who do you think you're fooling you know um i've never seen anybody do that on a lab before i've seen it since yeah uh, you know what what are we really doing here to breeds? we have a number of breeds that that specifically say should be shown untrimmed that emphasize it in in any number of different ways and yet we trim them can't help ourselves <laughs> so no but are we are doing a service or are we i know doing a yeah it's service? gonna be a, a lot that's, really, that's really the question yeah uh that that you deal with it if if you're taking a retrieving dog going back to my goals that comes from scotland where it's cold and damp Okay, and the water is really cold. Why would you want an open coat that's going to soak up water and bring that cold water and chill the body? Yep, exactly. It would be exactly wrong. So the standard says a waterproof jacket that wraps the body. That's what it asks for. It asks for it because that's what it needs to do its job. And we're taking it and we're doing away with it. Yep. The PBGV standard asks for a casual, natural, tousled breed, and we terry them, even to the point of doing eyebrows like like on a, on a, um, uh, a schnauzer, you know? <laughs> and what are we doing? We've taken setters and we've given them underlines and trimmed the, the, the trimmed the, 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 uh, uh, the bottom of the stifle. So it's coming in, you know, and a perfect underline and the whole bit. What are we doing here? Why, why, are, why are we really doing that? Why do we have Havanese that are supposed to have a, a silky coat and we have a cottony coat and we reward them? Yeah. Why do we- I'll give you one more just because this one really bugs me. <laughs> okay. The American Cocker Standard, and I'm being very careful in saying American Cocker. The American Cocker Standard says shall be trimmed to show the natural outline of the dog, excessive coat to be faulted. Okay? And we are now showing American Cocker Spaniels with the hair down to the floor in the same way you have on a Yorkie. And you know that that's the case. You've seen it, so have I. For sure. Okay. And why are we doing that? I mean, it's exactly the opposite of what the standard specifically spells out for you. To be shown, trimmed to show the natural outline. That's a quote. Yeah. And we don't have a natural outline. 
<laughs> we have no outline. <laughs> it's gone. Yeah. And we have this soft cottony coat. And I know of at least one Cocker Spaniel that literally drowned because it hadn't been cut down and it had all this excessive coat. Water weighs eight and a half pounds a gallon. We got a 15 inch dog that weighs 20 pounds, 25 pounds, 30 pounds, and it's carrying eight pounds of water. The dog drowned, it wouldn't let go of, of the bird that it was bringing back and it drowned and died. That's crazy. <laughs> It, it just does, and 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 that's that's a fact. I know I I know who the dog is. So um, the standard. No, I don't know what the answer is. It's just. It's, that's it's, it. My advice to judges is: please follow the breed standard. Yeah. And if you make it clear that you expect that the goldens will not be fluffed and puffed, they won't. Yeah, if you become known for that, they'll do their best not to do it. Exactly. Yeah. And you can make it known. I've had handlers that brought, I had one handler brought me in a golden. And as I'm going over the dog, I go like this and I can feel the silicone. Yeah. My, my fingers are literally sliding from the silicone that's on the dog. Never mind it, it's all standing on end. And I looked at the handler and I said, Don't you ever bring me a dog with all this crap on its coat again, or I'll excuse you from the ring. And they never did. They said, thank you. And that's it. They don't. They bath the dog before and they take the crap out of the coat. And by the way, that dog won the breed because it was still the best thing in there. And when it came in the group, it didn't have any of that crap in the coat. Yeah, I get that because it's not going to produce a year. You're, you're judging breeding stock. So, yeah, you know, I, I, I judge as, I've always judged as, as a breeder. I have a problem putting up a dog with a, with a, with a bad mouth, even if the standard doesn't, dis, doesn't disqualify it, uh, particularly if it's a wry mouth or, or uh, a bite that, that is uncomfortable for the dog so that it can't eat properly or, a level bite where the teeth are wearing down and you can literally see the nubs. Yeah. You know, you can see that the nerves are going to come out from the constant contact on there. Um, no, I, I, have a, that. I have a problem putting that up. Yeah. Um, over the years, yeah, I mean, you've had plenty of mentors and you touched on a few of them. <clears throat> Who do you think was your, your major, your primary mentor in this sport? Um, Dottie Mac. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. Um, I got to know Dottie really well um, to the point she used to call me in, in, in the last years. I got a call from her every day until the memory started going. Uh, and, and for many years, I was getting a call every day from her, um, or I called her. Uh, and sometimes it'd be a 30-second phone call, and sometimes it'd be an hour and a half. Uh, she certainly taught me a lot. Um, Going back, uh, Paige Elliott was uh, a friend, and we talked an awful lot about not just movement, but uh, golden, golden history and so forth. I have some books of hers back there in, in, in the bookcase, including uh, some really, uh, I have a copy of Sportsman's Cabinet that she gave to me. That's 1803, 1804. Uh, you know, those would be the, the two major ones, and Ginny line. Yeah, I knew you were close with Ginny, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ginny, of course, was close to Dottie. And, and uh, you know, it, it, but uh, I lived near, when I moved to California, I actually lived near Dottie. So I saw her a lot. And more recently, Pat Trotter. Yeah. For the same reason, because she was there. I had the distinct, wonderful learning experience, uh, I guess about six, seven years, six years ago, five years ago, when Dottie was still around, uh, and I was out visiting in, in California. I got a call from uh, Pat to pick Dottie up and come over to her place. And Plows was going to meet us there. Plows Tavern was going to meet us there. And we were going to go over her litter of puppies that were out of Duffy. That gorgeous bitch that, that uh, she'd won the group with. The 10th time, not the 11th time. <laughs> uh, and and um, they were, I think, six weeks old. And uh, I'm, I'm, what happened was 
the three ladies were sitting across from me. Jen was feeding me the dogs. And I had them on the table. And the idea was I would go over all the dogs and verbally describe what I was feeling so that we all didn't have to try and go over six-week-old puppies who weren't going to stand for it. Right. You know, no, no puppy would. And certainly well, that would not, be fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The bitches were fairly easy. We came to dogs, and um, I went over to the dogs, and, and then Pat says, okay, what do you think? Who's your number one pick? And I said, well, this is a problem because it depends whether you're picking as a breeder or picking as a, a show dog. You're picking a show dog or you're picking a breeder. And she said, what do you mean? And I said, well, this dog has just the right temperament to be a show dog. He's full of himself. He has all of, of the attributes of a really showy dog. He's very typey, but he's a little bit long. It doesn't have quite as good a front as this dog over here. But this dog's a deadhead. He'd rather go sleep under the chair than run around with, with, with the other puppies. So I don't think he's going to be as good a show dog. If I were picking as a breeder, I would pick him because he's cobbier and he's got a little better front end. And I think he just holds himself better and he's really pretty they're both really pretty moving but he's the better mover of the two because he's got that little bit better front and you know they got to be it's a it's a square right. breed so, um and the type was excellent on both of them right? as you would expect from pat and so i i would pick this one if i were picking with my breeder hat on and i'd pick this one if i were picking with my show hat on <laughs> and she said, that's our conundrum, and that's why you guys are here, because we can't decide what to do between these two. And you have exactly said exactly, you picked exactly the right things to go. Well, I was so honored, number one, to go over the puppies. And as we're talking about, you learn all these little nuanced things that you can only learn from somebody who's seeped in, in experience, it's like listen, listening to David Fitzpatrick talk about the peaks. Yeah, those little, those little quirky things that are peak things that are really part of, of, of a peak, but you never hear about, and you certainly don't hear in seminars. And and um, the same thing was 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 going on here. Dottie had heard it before. I don't know whether Plaus had or not. I had not. There were things there that I hadn't heard before. And I'm the one who's doing the talking, so that makes it harder uh, for me. I don't know whether I was being taught and that was what was going on. Or yes, well, they were being really lazy. Yes. They could all sit there and drink their wine. While <laughs> the so which one did you end up picking, or did they all end up picking? Um, we all agreed on that. There was one bitch that was clearly the standout. Yeah. Um, so that one wasn't difficult. They wound up keeping the breeder dog. And he's the one that now has several bests. Oh, wow. But he's the one who was the showier one is the one that's up in Washington State that's done some serious... Oh, yeah, I, I, I've seen that dog. Okay, wow, that's something. <laughs> okay, so he was he was by no means a slouch. Yeah. As, as, as type wise, he's just that hair longer. He's not long, but he's a hair less cobby than that the other dog. Sure. Than the other dog. Okay. That that's and now you're really getting your nitpicky kind of stuff that you can only do when 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 you have really, really good choices. One other thing to go back to what you asked me before as as, as a new judge, they don't get better just because you you keep them out there stacked forever. <laughs> yeah, Thor Brown, Tommy, point, get, they just get the point. <laughs> they're not going to get better standing there. Yeah. And, and that's serious because I've, I've watched a breeder judge doing a national specialty. I was stewarding for this person and they started nitpicking when they picked their four and then they picked two to go behind. Well, this is what they were going to keep and they started shuffling and they fell into fault judging, and the best in that class got moved back to fifth. 
Yeah. No, and I finally first. walked out and said to the judge, who I knew, they're not going to get any better. You need the point now. Yeah. They just get older. Yeah. <laughs> well, they get tired and they get fidgety yeah. and, and you start seeing things that aren't there and you start fault judging. Right. Big mistake. Once you've made your four, one, two, three, four. I have one here. more question for you. Sure. If you can meet the 20 year old Jeff, is there any advice you'd give him now? Be patient. Be patient. Yeah, yeah that's probably good advice for a lot of us. <laughs> it probably is. And, and, and the other thing that has nothing to do with dogs is what we were talking about before we started. See your glass is half full instead of half empty. Understand that use your abilities to, to, the, to your best advantage and you can still do this, this, and this even if you can't do that and that. You know, uh, to sit there and get angry because you lost on the day or, or, or uh, to get bitter because you can't, you know, you don't have the best in show dog and somebody else has the best in show dog and you had all these years and you still don't have a best in show dog. Look at what you do have instead of looking at what you don't have. And look at, the blessings. At look at the blessings that you have. And then some of that is because of this, you know, and, and it, 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 it certainly has made me look at, 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 at life a bit differently because you see your own mortality. Right. Um, and, and, but even as, as, as a 20 year old, we're always in this damn rush. Be patient. Yeah, I agree. It, it, it takes a long time to really learn stuff well. And that certainly goes for breeding and for showing. You know, you think you, you've bred two champions. Well, you know everything now. But let me tell you something. I'm judging 36 years. I'm over 50 years in dogs. I won't go tell you how many over, but it's over 50. And, and I was sitting last week at our shows outside the ring watching the uh, toy group, which I don't do. I only do one toy breed. And I watched the Havanese and I thought, geez, that's an awfully pretty dog. I wonder if it's as well made as it seems to be moving because you can't tell with that coat from outside the ring. So I asked the handler after she won the group, I asked her if I could go over the dog because there were still three more groups to go and I knew she was going to take a break. And she said, yeah, my crate's over here. I said, no, 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 can we go in the back? And we went to her setup and I put my hands on the front and damned if that dog didn't have a gorgeous front end on it. And that's what I really wanted to know. I already knew it had a pretty face because I could see it, but I needed to put my hands on the dog and feel what that layback was and what that return was. And if it was as good as it appeared to be from the way the dog was going, because sometimes they're foolish. Right, yeah. You know? Um, and, and no, it was. And the balance front and rear was excellent. And in the process, I felt the coat. And boy, did that have a gorgeous coat. It was really a good coat, correct coat for the breed. And, and afterwards, I'm thinking to myself, why the hell did I do that? I'm not really judging anymore. Why do I care? Well, I'm curious. So no, I'm exactly. still learning. I'm working. still learning. That, that, that's really my point. I have never done one assignment where I didn't learn something. Right. Not something major. Sometimes I was just trying to figure something out. Uh, I remember once having a, a, a Brittany and coming at me, it looked like the front was swinging like this, which of course is impossible. And it came at me and stopped, and I looked, and I said, what the hell was that? I said, would you go down and back again? And I'm sure the exhibitor thought she'd done something wrong. She didn't do anything wrong. I just wanted to know what the hell was going on with that front. When it came <laughs> back, I realized it was the elbows popping out. Oh, yeah. It was swinging from that. But I had to look at it again. And, I mean, that's a useless piece of information, but I was curious, so... Why not? Yeah, I think we're all, we all want to be students of this. A lot of judges, I think, they get approved for a, a new breed and they're already 
I hear judges, I see them doing on Facebook. I just got approved for nine breeds and I sent in my application for nine new ones. When the hell are you going to learn the nine you just got? Exactly, yeah. yeah. And I think that's why we see so much generic judging now. And I, I really worry about that. Um, we're, 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 we're losing the specialness of breeds. By, by taking away those little hallmark things that make them what they are, be it temperament or, or, or be it the look in the eye or, or whatever uh, it, it, it happens to be. Uh, when I, I heard Chuck Prado was telling me he went to a seminar um, and, and just because it was a new breed, and the uh, parent club representative who was doing the seminar was asked the question by somebody in the audience, what kind of slope do you want on the croup? And the answer was, what's a croup? <laughs> okay, and, and I don't know who it was, nor do I know what breed it was, and I don't care to, and it has nothing to do with the point. The point is that we have these instant experts who aren't. And how do we learn, particularly with breeds with smaller entries, how do we learn what a good one is? How do I learn what a good plot hound is if I've had my hands on two plot hounds in all the years that I'm judging? Exactly. Yeah, you can't. You're just going to make an entry. How, how, do I, how do I differentiate? How do I know? In the old days, when when you were younger and, and when I was starting out, you went to a show in the morning and you left the show after best in show, except maybe someday you left after your group. Right. Okay. But certainly on Saturday, you stayed right through best in show. And what did you do with all that time? Because, you know, your breed was on in the morning and you're, you're not leaving till five in the afternoon. What did you do? Well, you be asked and talked with the other people in your breed and you learned about the breed from those who had more experience than you and you learned about individual dogs uh, i remember asking uh when i was new asking somebody in in the group who happened to be a judge although they were a golden breeder and i said you know we had a monarchic puppy in 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 a litter that ricky sired i can't figure out where that came from and he said oh that comes from so and so who's three generations back in his pedigree he was known for throwing puppies who occasionally would throw a, a monarchy. Very valuable information. Never would have had it if we weren't sitting there talking. Oh, it, uh, it happens and all the time. Outside your group ring, and, and your group wasn't always the first group. Sometimes it was the last group. And so you watched other groups, and through almost osmosis, you learned what good dogs were in those other breeds because you'd see a similarity from show to show in the type of, of pug that was coming in the ring or the type of wire fox terrier or whatever. And, and your eye became accustomed to what's a good dog of, of other breeds that you really didn't know a whole lot about but you learned this is you know this this is what's 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 looked for in there we don't have that anymore now people don't win their class they leave they don't even stay to see who goes winners i know it's crazy crazy so yeah, how do you yeah. learn this stuff I, i'm sorry but these are things that experience is, is teaching me that we had an advantage well, there's and no question. Have that same advantage today, and they're not taking advantage of it. The opportunity yeah. is there. Yeah, but it's, it's a generation now. It's a, it's a win now generation. It's just well, no one I wants to learn. Well, I don't know what to attribute it to, but it, it it's causing us to lose the uniqueness of, of some of our breeds. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And, that, and some of the breeds are going to disappear just because nobody has them anymore. Let's hope not. <laughs> Anyway. Well, thanks, Jeffrey. It was great catching up with you. It's good to uh, see you. Likewise, always good to chat. Uh, you be well, and and uh, I I hope that uh, everybody takes everything that I said with a grain of salt because <laughs> it goes with the pepper. Uh, <laughs> That's a good line. <laughs> yeah, but, but you you, you kind of have to. But I hope it makes you think a little bit. That's 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 really my goal. Yeah. If you think about it, 
uh, maybe there's a grain of truth in there that that give you something new to to think about and 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 react with and and I love those beagles and uh, that, that that go with it. There, there's another breed that that's you know that soft expression sometimes that that that's beagle that speaks beagle and sometimes you don't see it anymore. Yeah. You get a sharp look, and that to me is that's not a beetle anymore. Exactly. All right. Okay. Well, be well. You as well, Jeffrey, and I hope to catch up somewhere. Always a pleasure. I'll uh, see you somewhere. We'll I hope. Catch up in Westminster. Perfect. Perfect. I'll, I'll see, see you, there. you there. Thanks, Jeff. You have a good yeah. night. You too. Bye bye. Thanks, Jeff. It was good to catch up with you. Uh, if you like what you're seeing here, make sure you press the like, share, and subscribe button. If you want to get a hold of me, get a hold of me at dogshowtips at gmail.com. Or if you want to find out what's happening in Will's World, go to willalexander.net. And don't forget about the dog show drive every Thursday with Wayne Cavanaugh and myself. Till next week. <laughs>